We can meme on Windows and oftentimes it deserves it, but one thing that Windows does really, really well is Task Manager. Task Manager is a great system monitor, whether it's for monitoring your process usage, your CPU usage, your disk usage, network usage, what devices you have, and all of that fun stuff. But over on the Linux side, there are great individual tools for getting all of this same sort of data. And today we're looking at System Monitoring Center, which brings all of this data into one place. So when you first open up the application, you'll be inside of the performance tab under the CPU section. If you want to change where it defaults to, go up to the icon in the corner here, go to settings, and then this tab is going to change the default tab, and this will change the subprocess tab. But in my case, I kind of like it just sitting on this section here. So in the performance area, we have the CPU performance, we have the RAM performance, the disk usage, the network usage, the GPU usage, and then the sensors. But let's start on the CPU and then work our way down. So each of these sections have information on the device itself. I'm not going to go through every single thing in here, but we have things like the average usage or the current CPU frequency. We have the number of physical cores and the number of logical cores and things like that. That. Now, this layout we're seeing here isn't actually the default layout. So if we go up to the cog here, we can actually change some information about how it's being shown. So right now we are on the per core chart, but if we go over to the average chart, it's just going to show you one graph for the entire CPU. Personally, I like to break it down by core. So if, say, one core is being hit really hard, it's really easy to see that. For most of the other sections as well, you can also change the foreground and background color. So right now the foreground color is set to green, set it to red, go select, and there we go. Now the graphs are red. I think that looks pretty good actually, but we'll set it back to green. Also, we can go and change the precision of the data being shown. So right now we are using full digits, but let's say we want to have one decimal place or we want to have three decimal places and things like the average usage now have that being shown. Now that's not going to be shown for things like the frequency because frequency just isn't reported at that level of detail. Likewise, it's not going to be reported at a full decimal place if you just set it to that instead. Now I can't demonstrate this because I'm not an absolute baller, but there's also this option here to go and select which device you want to be using. Right now I'm on CPU 0, but as we can see there is CPU 1 all the way up to 11. So if I had a system that had a second CPU in it, I could actually go and select that device and then see the data for that CPU. In this case, all it does is just shows the data for the same CPU, so it probably just shouldn't even show those extra things anyway. And RAM works in a fairly similar way, obviously with no device choices this time because that doesn't really make any sense to see. Now, it also shows your swap memory down here, and it has this little thing here that says show. This will actually show you where on your system your swap is located. In my case, this is on a petition on my NVMe drive, and yes, I've given it 48 gigabytes. Don't question me. Um, it is what it is. Now, under the configuration section, basically it's the same sort of stuff, but also a data unit. Now, by default, data unit is set to auto, and it auto-detected as being gigabyte, which makes sense for how much RAM I have on my system. But if you'd rather see it as something like bytes, or that's a big number, or like kilobytes, megabytes, terabytes, whatever you want to see it as, that's also configurable as well. But in my case, auto works fine. Now, there is this other show button near your RAM, but it doesn't actually do anything. I'm not sure why. Maybe I'm missing one of the optional dependencies, which just wasn't listed, but it's just here for seemingly no reason. One thing I would like to see change about these show buttons, though, is make it obvious it's a button, or make it obvious it's a link, or whatever you want to do with it. Right now, if you hover over it, there's no tooltips or anything to indicate that there's something you can click here. But under the disk section, we've got a bit more configuration. Like with the CPU, we can actually go and select which device we want to be seeing, and not just the physical devices, but also the petitions as well. So right now we are on the NVMe device itself. We can also go and select the third petition on that device and see information specifically about that. Now, one thing I would have liked to see here is the same thing as the CPU section, where you can see everything at once. Sadly, that isn't an option. Now, regardless of whether you select a drive or a petition, down the bottom here, there's going to be the show details section where we can see a lot of extra information. Things like 
Because this is a petition, we can see what the name of the parent disk is, we can see what file system is on it, we can see what the mount point is, and things like that. But if we go and do the same thing, but over on a drive instead, say for the SDA drive, a lot of the information is going to be missing. Now it is going to say not mounted, but not mounted isn't exactly the correct terminology here. This isn't a petition, so obviously it's not going to be mounted anywhere. It should make some indication of what's actually going on here, but I don't know if that information is actually available. I guess you could infer it from the fact that this drive doesn't have a parent name, and if there's no parent, obviously it can't be a petition, because that petition would be on a drive. I might be mistaken there and someone can correct me on that, but that seems at least logical in my mind. Because if we go over to something like any of my SDB petitions, these have all of the same not mounted symbols, but this actually is a petition. It's just a petition for my Windows system rather than my Linux system. And now onto the networking, which is basically the same thing as disk usage, basically has the same customization as well. You can select different devices and things like that. So we're going to skip over that and go over to the GPU, which isn't working the way that anybody would expect it to work. So it's not measuring your GPU usage or anything like that. When I'm not recording and when I am recording, this bar is exactly the same. What it's doing, I think, is measuring the frame rate of the application, which apparently is 60 FPS, even though my display is running at 165 Hertz, which I am absolutely certain is the case. So I think this section right now is kind of broken and kind of useless. Something that's not broken and not useless is your sensors. Now, sensors under Linux are fairly hit and miss. So in my case, I've got some GPU temps, I've got my GPU fan speed, my GPU voltage. I think this is my CPU temp, and I'm not sure... Oh, my NVMe drive temp, of course. It literally says NVMe right there, which is basically the same information I get by running the application inside of my terminal. But if I was running my system over on Windows, I know that more stuff would be getting detected, but a lot of this stuff under Linux is just sort of flaky in the first place, and there's nothing wrong with this application itself. But if you did have a lot of sensors, you go and filter by the name, or you can go and filter by what the sensor is actually for. So by the temperature of devices, by the fan sensors or fan speed, or by the voltage and current sensors. But there is a lot more to this application. One of those things being the process monitor, which works like you'd expect any standard sort of process monitor to work. We have the names of the processes, the PIDs, the user that owns the process, the memory usage, the CPU usage, the disk write speed, and the disk read speed. I got those backwards, but you got what I was saying. And you can go and resize these tabs and have it however you want. You can go and reorder the list as well if that's what you want to do. And it's certainly not as powerful as a dedicated application like, say, HTOP, but it does what a general user is going to need. So if we go and search for Xterm, an application I have opened on this window here, we can go and right click on this, we can go and do a stop, continue process, terminate, or kill process. In this case, I'm going to go and do a terminate, it's going to go and confirm whether we want to do that, I'm going to say yes, and now the application is gone. And like over on the performance side, there is some extra detail stuff as well. So let's go and right click on this alacrity, go down to details. It's going to tell us what the application is doing. So this is its name, who owns it, what the priority is. In this case, it sets a priority zero. If I want to go and change that, we can actually go and right click and change it in here. And a bunch of other things about like what it's doing on the CPU, where it's writing to, where it's actually running, things like that. You could go a lot more detailed with this. One thing it's not showing is recursive child processes. So it's only showing the process directly running as a child, but maybe that process opened up a new process and another one, and another one, and another one. And you have this really long tree of processes, which obviously wouldn't fit in an interface like this, but there might be ways to demonstrate it. But for what it's trying to do, I think this information is perfectly fine. It could be better laid out in some ways like... This one right here, we just have a bunch of numbers all separated on new lines, but it's good enough. Right now, we're seeing processes from every single user. If you just want to see processes from your current user, clicking on this button here is going to do exactly that. And then from every user besides your user, this button right here. Now, sometimes when you switch between these sections, especially when you do it a bit quickly, you might start to see some like flickering. That goes away basically in an instant later, 
I'm guessing it's some sort of rendering issue. Next up is the users tab, which does basically what you think. It lists out the currently logged in users, which in my case is my current user and ending that user session would probably be a really, really bad idea. But we can see some details on it, like who the user is, what their UID is, where their home directory is, and things like that. I actually should check what happens if I press this off camera. I'm not going to do it now though, because if it works, that would be really bad. There's also a section here on things being started at startup, but just because they are listed here, doesn't mean they are going to be auto started. So all of these things are a part of your XDG auto start, which is located either for the system wide in slash Etsy slash XDG slash auto start, and then whatever the desktop file is, or inside of slash home slash your user slash dot config slash auto start, and then the desktop file. But these won't actually be run unless you have some sort of auto start implementation installed on your system. When you right click on something, there is going to be an add option. This add option isn't going to be for adding to that specific thing. It's going to be for adding a new desktop file. Why it's set up like that, I don't really know. It's really strange. I would like it so you could just right click somewhere else on the screen, but that might be a limitation for the GUI library being used but you could always just go into the file location and just make it normally anyway. This is sort of just a convenient way to add one if you really want to do it here. Next up is the services section, which in many ways works in a fairly similar way to what we see with processes. So these services are going to be your systemd services. Obviously, if you're not on a systemd system, this section isn't going to work. Actually, I don't know if the application is going to run full stop. I haven't tried that. If you're using something like Devuin or Void, let me know if it actually functions. In here, you can go and start, stop, restart, reload, enable, disable, and mask any of the services you want to do. Now, keep in mind, if the service wasn't already started by your user, there's not really much you can do in here without opening up the application with something like sudo or doas or opening up on your root account. So something like crony, for example, if you want to go and do something like restart it, it's going to say that I don't have the correct level of authentication. One thing that is missing from this list is starting as a user service. So unless you're opening this up with sudo from a regular user account, there's not really much you can do on this section. But if all you want to do is monitor your services, this is going to do it basically perfectly fine. And then the final tab is the system tab, basically telling you some extra information about your system. For example, my computer vendor is a system manufacturer. My model is a system product name because I built this system myself and it doesn't actually have data set for this. Actually, other information is kind of janky as well. Right now, my windowing system is TTY, which doesn't make any sense, but I'll take it for what it is. As for the missing information, that's missing like it should be. I'm not using a display manager on my system. I'm not using a desktop environment. My, I guess this probably should say it's based on something because my system is Arch Linux. So technically it's based on Arch Linux, but sure that's fine. And my version or code name is missing because Arch doesn't actually have a proper version number. And the final thing I want to mention is the floating summary. Basically, a little floating window that will show you some information about your system. If we go up to the magnifying glass, click on floating summary, we'll have our CPU usage and our RAM usage. If we then go into our settings section, go to the floating summary, we can then choose what information we want to see. So things like my disk read speed, my disk write speed, and things like that. Now, be very careful with this window. If I go and quit this and then try to reopen it, uh, this happens. So if you ever want to quit the window, make sure you quit it inside of the application through the interface it has there. Otherwise, you have to restart and then reopen it for it to actually work properly. But even so, I don't know why this feature exists. The only time I'd ever really want to see this information is when I'm playing a game and Mango HUD does a far, far better job at showing it. But I'm sure that some random person out there probably likes this feature and hey, that's great for them. You can go and try it out. Now, obviously, individual CLI apps can do all of this same sort of stuff. You don't need this application to see your CPU usage or your processors or your RAM usage or your disk usage or anything like that. 
but it is a nice application that brings all of this data into one place and makes it really, really easy to see. So go and try out System Monitoring Center and let me know what you think in the comment section down below. If you like this video, I'm gonna go and like the video. And if you really like the video and you wanna become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, strong barrel pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robinson Plays. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.